Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to our first ever FPCI Ambassadorial Lecture in cooperation with the delegation of the European Union to Indonesia. FPCI is proud to host the series in which today we have here with us His Excellency Ambassador Vincent Piquet, Ambassador of the European Union to Indonesia. Welcome, Ambassador. Good afternoon, today, everybody. Good afternoon. Today, we are also joined by students from six universities in and around Jakarta, which are Universitas Indonesia, Binus University, Universitas Bakri, LSPR Institute, UPN Veteran Jakarta, and Universitas Pelita Harapan, my own alma mater. So welcome everybody, and thank you to our FPCI chapters for tuning in. It's not every day that university students can get the chance to have a one-on-one -on -one dialogue with the ambassador, so I'm sure that we'll have a great discussion today. My name is Cindy, and I will be the moderator for today's event. Ladies and gentlemen, this ambassadorial lecture series aims to discuss various aspects of the bilateral relations between Indonesia and the European Union, especially during the unprecedented time of the COVID-19 pandemic. And today, our topic of discussion will be the European European Union's prescription in averting a global economic crisis after COVID-19. So don't forget to share your moments with us from this dialogue by tagging at FPC Indo and at uni underscore Europa on your social media posts. Now, before we begin, I would like to invite the founder of Foreign Policy Community of Indonesia, Dr. Dino Patijalal, to deliver his welcoming remarks. Okay. Hi, everybody. Uh, this is... Uh, Dino Jalal, and I'm so happy to see all of you uh, looking uh, healthy, and also my good friend, Ambassador Vincent uh, Piquet. Uh, this is uh, the first series of uh, uh, Ambassador Vincent's uh, dialogue with uh, Indonesian students uh, across Indonesia, and I'm so glad that PCI is able to work with the EU delegation uh, in Jakarta to, to make this happen. And uh, I think the views and the policies of the European Union will be very critical. You know, this is a pivotal year for, for the world. Uh, what is happening now with the COVID-19 crisis is something no one saw uh, last year. Uh, you remember that we had a big, big uh, event last year at a conference on Indonesian foreign policy. And I don't think any of us uh, predicted uh, that this would happen. So, uh, you know, all of us are trying to figure out uh, how to get out of the COVID-19 crisis, but also how to deal with all the economic and social fallout from that crisis. Uh, FPCI had just uh, uh, written an article in Raket Merdeka uh, pointing out that uh, there will be a global mental health crisis that will accompany the second wave of COVID-19 that will come uh, at the uh, second half of this year. And uh, the UN Secretary General, Antonio Guterres, has said that uh, every country should be prepared for it. But in Indonesia, if you look at the budget, uh, there is almost nothing allocated for global, for, for a national uh, mental health uh, crisis that might be uh, coming. So uh, again, there's a lot of things that we don't know, uh, not just about the virus, but about the blind spots we may have uh, in, in the addressing the, the economic, social, and even political uh, fallout of, of the crisis. And uh, uh, the European Union has a very interesting angle on it, uh, not only because uh, EU was uh, one of the epicentrums of, this cri of the COVID-19, especially if you see what's happening in Italy and, and France, yeah. Uh, but also the uh, European Union is the uh, second largest economy in the world after the United States. You know, if you compare all the EU economies, uh, I think there are about $19 trillion altogether. Uh, and if you count the purchasing power parity, EU is number three after the United States and China. And the EU is about 22% of uh, the, the world economy. So what the EU does uh, and whether or not uh, the EU uh, would be part of the global solutions to avoid uh, economic uh, crisis will be uh, very important for us uh, to know and, and to follow. So there's no other person better than Ambassador Vincent uh, Piquet to address this issue. And I hope you will all have a nice uh, and uh, fruitful discussions. Don't be shy uh, to ask questions, uh, please. Uh, you know, this is very important. Uh, 
uh, Ambassador Vincent loves taking questions. So please ask whatever you want to ask. There's no such thing as a stupid question, right? Uh, in fact, some of the stupidest questions are the best questions. <laughs> So uh, have a good discussions. Uh, I'm not going to stay around because I don't want to sound like a big brother uh, monitoring the discussions. Uh, I want this to be a very open, free, and uh, mutually beneficial discussion for all. Good luck. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> I have no sound. You were, no, now you're, you're on. Yes, may I invite His Excellency Ambassador Vincent Piquet? The floor is yours. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, uh, uh, Dino, for the introduction and uh, for uh, the cooperation that you've offered uh, from the side of um, FPCI um, with uh, the EU delegation in, in Jakarta. Um, I got to know um, FPCI uh, bilaterally, of course, but uh, my real FPCI baptism was in the big, big events uh, that you uh, referred to uh, held um, in Jakarta um, in October last year uh, with a crowd of, uh, I believe, around 10,000 young people, students uh, coming from uh, all over the place. Um, uh, to join in this uh, this big, big, uh, spontaneous think tank uh, about uh, international relations, foreign policy, security issues, and and, and uh, whatnot. So um, that was uh, that was fantastic, and that made me think that I, as delegation, uh, very much um, uh, wanted to. Uh, 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 to um, uh, cooperate with uh, with FPCI uh, for our further outreach. Um, uh, thank you, Cindy, as moderator for for for, for your uh, work this afternoon. Um, maybe a, a brief word about myself. Uh, I've been um, the EU's ambassador in Indonesia, um, also accredited to Brunei uh, Dar es Salaam uh, for ten months now. Um, it feels uh, uh, like it started yesterday. At the same time, so much has happened uh, in the past 10 months, and particularly, of course, the past four months, uh, that it feels like a lot longer at the same time. Uh, by origin, I'm uh, from the Netherlands, my home country. Um, uh, I left it, however, already in 1992, uh, when I uh, gave up my job in the, uh, in the Dutch government and uh, in order to join um, the European Commission uh, in Brussels, European Commission being the executive branch of, uh, of the EU. And uh, ever since I've uh, uh, worked for the, uh, for the EU um, in Brussels, but also with a number of postings uh, outside uh, Europe, in uh, Central and Eastern Europe, uh, to start with, uh, including uh, four years in, in uh, Moscow, where uh, Pagdino was posted as well. Um, it did not uh, coincide at the time, but, uh, but uh, we share the experience. And uh, later down the road, I um, um, moved to Asia, Central Asia, um, and with postings in, uh, in Malaysia and, uh, and Hong Kong. And um, before coming here uh, in Indonesia, I worked uh, on the uh, North Africa region uh, within the EU's neighborhood 
um, very, very dynamic, very, very challenging uh, uh, set of issues there. And um, uh, so that is uh, also part of my intellectual baggage, if you like. Very typical um, um, uh, diplomatic career for the uh, EU, I'd say, with two postings outside Europe and then one posting back uh, in, uh, in Brussels and with possibilities of changing from region to region. Um, the EU delegation, Jakarta, um, uh, about 60 staff, uh, of whom uh, one third, around 20, uh, are expatriates, uh, Europeans, um, um, who, like me, have, have a, um, a diplomatic career of, um, of, uh, of rotations. Uh, but 40 local uh, colleagues uh, <coughs> who cover uh, all policy areas that, that we deal with and who also uh, work on the management of um, our cooperation programs with, uh, with Indonesia. Um, one, we, we represent the EU uh, with a mandate from the, uh, the two presidents of the, uh, uh, of the, um, of the uh, EU. Um, and um, we uh, uh, play a role in uh, coordinating the, um, the, uh, the network of EU uh, member state embassies in, um, in Jakarta, uh, accredited to Indonesia uh, um, uh, from here. And uh, what that means is, of course, not that we replace um, the bilateral relations that uh, individual member states have uh, with Indonesia, but uh, that we work together on common topics that are under the EU uh, competence uh, and uh, that we define um, uh, common lines to take and policies and uh, projects, events, et, et cetera. Uh, we meet very, very regularly with uh, all the EU missions, um, even during the, the, the COVID crisis, maybe even more, uh, with uh, every month at the minimum a meeting of the EU, all the EU ambassadors um, in, in, in Indonesia, chaired by myself, but also meetings at the level of the political councils, the trade councillors, the consular group, um, as well as the group dealing with cultural uh, and education affairs. So a very tight network of uh, diplomatic missions uh, that um, uh, uh, we, we run here, uh, as in other capitals uh, throughout the world. Now, yeah, uh, let's come to the topic and, um, and I'll uh, um, give a few remarks. And then indeed, as uh, Pactino has said, I'm, I'm very uh, happy to enter into something of a discussion with you. A bit difficult with this medium maybe, but we will try nonetheless. And as uh, Pactino said, don't be shy and uh, say what you have on your mind, uh, your questions, but also your comments. Now, yeah, um, the global context, um, I start with that. Um, what is absolutely clear is that uh, the COVID-19 crisis has uh, changed the political landscape uh, around the, the globe. Um, it has um, aggravated certain tensions. It has highlighted uh, weaknesses in the, um, uh, in the international system. And it has uh, laid there uh, vulnerabilities uh, of uh, countries individually, but also of uh, the multilateral uh, uh, governance uh, um, uh, system we have. Um, we have to face a tremendous impact for the economic uh, globalization uh, that has taken shape uh, ever since the second uh, World War, but, but particularly after the 1980s, uh, with a, uh, a, a number of um, economic rivalries having emerged, partly prompted also by political rivalries, um, competitive relationships between global powers or regional powers. Um, we have seen um, uh, an, um, uh, an a further uh, growing bipolarity uh, between uh, uh, in the United States and China uh, that is affecting uh, world politics uh, for sure. 
uh, you've seen uh, the, the, uh, the rise of inequalities uh, among nations, um, uh, which of course is a uh, potential source of, of conflict, um, uh, whether it's civil or, or military. Um, and we've seen in many cases also impact on human rights, um, individual rights as we knew them, with <clears throat> uh, governments of, uh, of countries um, uh, restricting certain rights that we have grow, had grown used to uh, for the sake of uh, strengthening the capacity, their capacity to uh, to deal with uh, with the um, uh, with the COVID nineteen uh, crisis. Um, the global governance system is is under pressure, severe pressure even um, at the level of the UN, um, with um, indeed a uh, important moral and political leadership uh, remaining for uh, the UN uh, and its key bodies, the UN General Assembly and the UNSC. Um, but at the same time, with uh, a, a fair degree of uh, skepticism and criticism about what some of the UN uh, bodies have, have done. Um, and particularly, this has, of course, focused on uh, WHO and its um, uh, 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 manner of addressing and performance in addressing uh, the COVID crisis. Now, the, you know, uh, the country that has uh, criticized the WHO most, uh, the United States, and um, we, we don't, uh, has to, it gone to the extreme decision to uh, withdraw uh, the funding of the, uh, uh, for the WHO. On the EU side, we don't agree with that. Uh, we, uh, our view is that, yes, we may uh, need to, uh, and, and we should, uh, of course, examine closely how uh, WHO and other institutions have performed, um, but not in a sort of vindictive manner, uh, but in a manner to see how um, the performance can be uh, improved uh, uh, for the next crisis, as and when, not if and when, but as and when it comes. Um, but tremendous pressure uh, at, at, that, uh, at that level. Um, uh, international sol solidarity was tested. Um, uh, the, uh, we saw that, of course, also in Europe uh, at the start of the crisis, which took us by surprise. And uh, the first reaction of, uh, of, of member states was naturally uh, uh, to um, uh, focus on the um, on the interest of the, the, uh, the national citizens and uh, to make sure that uh, they had uh, enough uh, equipment and, and medications available uh, for helping the crisis at home. And that uh, has caused some political frictions at the time. Uh, I must say that afterwards, uh, this has uh, uh, quickly um, changed. And <clears throat> as on the whole, the EU internally has worked very hard to make sure that uh, the member states that needed it most had the uh, the means or got the means um, uh, to deal with the crisis at home. And means whether it was money uh, from the EU budget uh, <coughs> or whether it was uh, physical supplies uh, by other member states um, uh, in the form of equipment, uh, but also uh, in, in a, a large uh, number of cases also in the in the form of direct medical assistance uh, by, by doctors and medics uh, that went over to the countries uh, that needed them. So um, solidarity was tested in Europe, but also in other parts of, um, of, of the world and um, um, uh, in, in this, uh, this very uh, climat climactic um, uh, phase of, of the crisis. Uh, at the same time, there's good news um, um, in, in, the, in the sense that a lot of money has been raised uh, for international action uh, to help particularly the most um, vulnerable countries uh, overcome uh, the crisis. Um, in late April, for, for example, uh, there was a large global uh, pledging summit uh, co-hosted uh, by um, uh, a number of G20 members, and that included the, uh, the European Union, and it raised uh, seven and a half billion euros uh, 
uh, I'm sure how much that is in rupees, um, for uh, therapeutics uh, assistance and for vaccine uh, development. Um, a similar um, pledging event happened in, in, in June, um, uh, uh, which also raised uh, 5 billion uh, euros. And bilaterally, um, the European Union has, uh, has raised uh, 36 billion euros total uh, of uh, assistance uh, for third countries. Um, of this money, uh, 350 million euros uh, are for ASEAN, and within that package, of, uh, there is 20 million euros uh, for Indonesia. And uh, that's for projects that we are either implementing already uh, or that are being uh, prepared right now. Um, the EU does that in, uh, in, the, in the formula and the motto of uh, what we call Team Europe, uh, whereby we um, make clear uh, that uh, we want to help um, um, the third country partners uh, through joint efforts by the EU institutions as well as the, um, the, the member states uh, individually, all teaming up in order to have the best possible response uh, to the needs that we see uh, around us, um, including in Indonesia. Going back to the economy, um, impact of the crisis, definitely. Um, it has highlighted once again the, um, uh, the, the um, weaknesses and the pressures on uh, the global trading system, um, severe pressure even. Um, you know uh, that, that uh, WTO was uh, already weakened uh, before the crisis, uh, particularly by the, um, uh, the US decision uh, to uh, uh, withdraw its support uh, from uh, the dispute settlement uh, panel. And, um, and that, of course, that panel uh, is, a, um, is a, a key tool for ensuring uh, that members of the WTO live up uh, to the obligations that they have uh, assumed by becoming a member. Um, so that was a, a, um, a very sore point that uh, we are dealing with right now. Um, the EU, together with uh, a, no a number of other WTO members, about 18 of them, um, has set up a, uh, an alternative uh, tribunal system uh, that, that sort of replaces um, the uh, original WTO dis dis dispute settlement panel um, uh, for as long as it remains uh, in capacity. We're seeking, we're seeking uh, support um, from other countries from, uh, in the WTO for that system, uh, including um, Indonesia. And the message that we are conveying with that um, action is very much a message that without a multilateral tra trading system, without a, a strong adherence by, by common rules uh, of all WT mem members, uh, we are not helping ourselves and we are not going to help uh, the uh, economic recovery uh, that we need. We are not going to help um, the uh, resumption of global trade uh, at the level that we need uh, after the crisis. So a strong adherence uh, to uh, the multilateral system um, um, is what we um, advocate and not only politically, but also through uh, action, through uh, the example that I've, uh, I've, uh, I've just given. Another um, impact of the crisis, uh, I think, has been, and it is for not just for the economy, but for, for societies as a whole, is the, uh, uh, the place and the role of, of disinformation. Now, we knew uh, that disinformation existed already, of course. Um, the EU has been frequently the, uh, the target of uh, disinformation campaigns, uh, often state-sponsored, and there are certain countries that believe in that um, uh, method of, um, of um, outreach. Um, during the crisis, of course, we saw a proliferation of 
of all sorts of um, disinformation uh, sources and, and objectives. And basically, they all served uh, uh, two things, either the promotion of, uh, of national narratives, uh, political narratives, uh, competitive narratives, um, or uh, they simply uh, sought uh, uh, the uh, uh, promotion of uh, more populist narratives uh, relating to the origins of causes um, of, uh, of the disease, so relating to uh, certain uh, uh, ethnic or racial groups uh, and, uh, and uh, other, uh, other aspects. So um, this is something that um, uh, has taken a form that uh, we were definitely unprepared for as, as EU and uh, it has necessitated a, a hard rethink of uh, many of the things we used to do and very much um, um, uh, we are determined to um, not arm ourselves I would say but certainly to make ourselves more resilient uh, to the, um, uh, the sort of disinformation campaigns that uh, uh, that we have uh, have witnessed um, just a couple of weeks ago, uh, the European Commission and uh, together with the EU's High Representative for uh, Foreign and Security Policy uh, published a, uh, a policy paper um, uh, in, on that very topic, and uh, we are now discussing the implementation of that with member states. Um, before we start uh, then rolling out, uh, out what um, has been um, agreed. Um, in the wake of the crisis, uh, uh, of course, also uh, um, um, new ideas about um, uh, came into being about uh, how to promote um, our um, resilience uh, in economic uh, terms, um, resilience um, in, uh, in the form of self-reliance uh, on certain products that we discovered we no longer have uh, or no longer produce uh, on our own uh, soil, uh, discussion that happened in Europe, but certainly also uh, here in Indonesia. And, um, and that's, of course, a natural reaction. Uh, we want to uh, make ourselves stronger uh, for when a next uh, crisis, a pandemic or whatever, uh, were to happen and uh, make sure that uh, some vital goods, some vital supplies, some vital production um, capacity um, exists and um, uh, will allow us to respond uh, properly um, as, as best we can uh, in the next um, um, uh, in the next uh, uh, time when it's needed. Um, so the notion of uh, strategic so sovereignty, uh, not so much in, in military terms, but there is of course a defense uh, dimension at the background as well, but particularly in economic terms, uh, strength, uh, the emphasizing resilience and the capacity uh, domestic capacity is important. Uh, for the EU, nevertheless, uh, that objective does not diminish our objective to um, stay engaged and integrated in the global economy. Uh, we are not withdrawing from, um, from um, the, uh, the global trading system. Uh, there is no turning back of globalization to go back uh, to an economic situation like we had in the in the 1970s and, uh, or 80s is just unthinkable. Um, or if, it, if you can think it, of course, there would be major and major economic uh, costs uh, related uh, to it. Um, but we have to think about that. Uh, we have to think about the fact that um, our companies are at times bought up uh, in unfair ways. Uh, by foreign buyers, by hostile buyers. Um, and right now that is a particular issue because the COVID crisis has, um, um, has reduced uh, the market values of companies, um, has um, um, uh, caused that co companies are running out of cash and are sometimes desperate to get uh, money. Uh, to keep um, uh, the, the production uh, alive and to keep the uh, 
uh, the, uh, the em their employees uh, paid. Uh, so in other words, there is a very fertile ground potentially for hostile bids. And in particular by um, companies, often state owned, uh, who are subsidized and who have as a result of that, a lot more cash uh, in the kitty. Uh, that is something that we are very wary of, and even though uh, our market, uh, the internal market of the EU, uh, will remain, is open and will remain the most open market in the world, I'm sure of that, uh, we want to make sure that our, some uh, companies, some countries, uh, do not uh, profit from that um, um, uh, uh, un unfairly. So. Uh, protecting ourselves against uh, this unfair competition, uh, against unfair uh, takeovers, and um, is something we will do, definitely um, wish to uh, pursue. Now, a last point on the um, at the macro level on the um, on the economy uh, is is poverty, and uh, because in a crisis like this. Um, as any other crisis, who suffers the most? Uh, it is the poor. Uh, it is poor people. It is poor countries. Uh, they are most vulnerable. They are uh, most um, uh, uh, easily uh, uh, hurt uh, economically and also uh, socially and, and uh, politically as uh, as well. Now, uh, I apply that for a moment to the EU itself. Uh, we had the, the tremendous financial crisis uh, back in 2008-9. Um, uh, it was overcome uh, by 2013 or so. And uh, over the past uh, seven years, we had had a tremendous uh, 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 result, uh, achievement in, uh, in bringing back growth to all of the uh, individual member states of the European Union in uh, lowering unemployment rates in creating new jobs in getting investment uh, back into the companies, uh, all in all in sanitizing the, the banking system and making it a lot stronger than it, than it was. And um, of course, now in the space of three, four months, we have to simply and, and soberly uh, 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 observe that um, many of the gains uh, are simply have been wiped out. If you look at unemployment, particularly, uh, many of the jobs that we uh, had created have, uh, have been lost, and unemployment rates uh, in all countries, uh, but of course, particularly in um, uh, in some the countries that were most hit by the crisis. Uh, are back at totally unacceptable and unsustainable levels. Uh, so that is, is a tremendous uh, uh, task we will have uh, for the coming uh, period. Um, of course, we do know, or the forecasts are, uh, that um, if we get keep uh, the, um, uh, the pandemic under control, uh, we will be able to again uh, generate a, a, a good uh, growth level uh, next year. The forecast is uh, that growth will be back uh, at about 6% uh, next, next year uh, with the big if uh, and the big conditionality of, uh, of uh, COVID having, um, uh, having uh, been brought under control. Um, so, but even with that level of growth, we will only uh, we will not be able to recuperate everything we lost in, in this year, and we will not be able to recoup bring back all uh, the newly unemployed uh, back into jobs, and we still have to have face up to the tremendous problem of indebtedness of companies, uh, companies that over the past three four months uh, have hardly earned a thing, have kept their people on the payroll, partly the subsidies. Uh, from the governments, but uh, still they haven't sold uh, very much and as a result we are indebted. Uh, so that is a big, big, big job uh, that we will need to um, uh, uh, do in, in Europe, bring back um, the uh, financial and uh, 
uh, employment performers, uh, performance uh, to the levels um, uh, that we had um, in the beginning of this year. You can apply this also to Indonesia, of course. Um, um, I won't go into detail here, but <clears throat> um, country have done a tremendous job on the um, sustainable development goals, the SDGs um, on track uh, uh, to uh, achieve all of them by the year 2030. Uh, now, I'm not saying that that is going to be impossible, but clearly with um, hundreds of thousands of people, again, under the poverty line, um, with um, an estimated two to three million people newly unemployed um, uh, in, in these uh, very months, uh, there is a tremendous setback to that uh, uh, strategic economic goal that uh, Indonesia was, uh, was pursuing and, um, and will continue uh, to pursue uh, by, uh, and achieve by the year 2030. So a tremendous uh, rethink um, and, and intensification of the economic uh, policy is going to be, um, be necessary. Um, okay, now a, a couple of observations um, on specifically the economic uh, response, which is what um, um, I was particularly asked to focus on. And um, um, how do we get these economies back, back uh, in, in, in action, in motion? And how do we avoid uh, a, a collapse? And I think what I'm saying uh, with, um, you know, with reference to the uh, uh, EU um, is applicable in, in many respects to, uh, to all economies around the world. Uh, because we, we live and, and work and earn our living uh, in the same globalized uh, system. And, uh, uh, and that globalized system uh, um, is, 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 uh, is characterized by globalized production, uh, the, the, um, um, the use of, uh, of uh, supply chains, uh, products uh, from coming, uh, part, part products or parts of products coming from different countries in order to be um, uh, assembled or uh, put together um, in, uh, in a, th a fourth country. And um, so that uh, globalized product production system uh, with uh, products, uh, production coming in, uh, happening in multiple location is, is of course under a tremendous strain. Um, and um, it, it's, uh, if you think about it in the reality of what you see in the shops, uh, the, uh, for instance, the, the company Thara and the Spanish uh, uh, textiles and fashion uh, where uh, firm, global chain, uh, very popular in Europe, very popular here in Asia, including Indonesia. It always managed to have the same new fashion line uh, for the season out in the shops in exactly the same uh, uh, point in the year. Uh, wherever they are, of course, with a difference uh, between the northern and the southern hem hemisphere because of the, uh, of the, of the climate. Uh, but uh, that, to do that now is extremely difficult uh, for the simple reason that supply chains have been uh, disrupted, um, logistical chains have been disrupted, etc. Et uh, so uh, we have to, uh, uh, the companies will have to adjust to that reality and see how best uh, they can, um, can um, uh, uh, restore uh, what they uh, used to have. So, and what does it mean? It means that uh, uh, we have to uh, make sure that um, the COVID crisis will not uh, cause uh, a breakdown in that uh, global production uh, um, methodology, uh, which is very much the, uh, the, the hallmark of, uh, of modern uh, manufacturing uh, today. Um, the same is true for logistics. Um, uh, the risk is a breakdown of log logistics. Well, it, it's not a risk to some, uh, if, you, if you like, uh, because we've seen uh, logistics breakdown over the past 
uh, three, four months. Um, airlines are on the ground, the planes are parked uh, on the tarmacs of the airports. Um, ships uh, are in the ports and not just uh, the, the cruises that used to um, uh, go to, uh, to Venice and to Bali uh, and to, uh, to, to Sydney. Uh, no, it's also, also the, uh, the uh, maritime transport. Uh, so there is a tremendous um, problem now in maintaining in, um, in these logistical lines, uh, in avoiding uh, a breakdown in uh, logistics and, to, and in making sure uh, that goods continue to be delivered uh, to the clients uh, on time, uh, within reasonable time. Uh, in Europe, uh, we have had uh, over the past four year, months um, a situation where our internal borders um, uh, were closed. I'm talking about the borders between member states within the, the passport free um, uh, union called the, the Schengen system. Um, uh, that has had an enormous impact uh, on transport and on trade. Uh, we solved it with, uh, uh, with, uh, with certain measures, uh, but at the end of the day, the real solution is opening up the internal borders. And that fortunately, uh, fortunately is uh, something that has started uh, to happen uh, uh, 15th of, of June, uh, so a good two weeks ago, uh, when uh, the internal borders were uh, reopened. Um, now the next step is, of course, our external border at the present moment is, is closed uh, for uh, foreign entrants uh, unless uh, they come uh, to Europe with, uh, uh, for specific business or have uh, permanent uh, uh, residency uh, uh, titles in the EU. And uh, for the foreign entrants, we will uh, start uh, uh, reopening uh, the borders uh, from the 1st of July. It will be gradual uh, and it will be partial. So not all countries will be able to benefit from this and this, um, this decision, uh, who can and who can't, is very much determined by the, uh, the uh, medical uh, and pandemic uh, conditions uh, of, um, of uh, the countries of uh, origin of, uh, of the travelers. In Indonesia, of course, we have seen something similar and we are still seeing it. There's tremendous restrictions on the, particularly the, not only the external travel and flights, but on the, also on the domestic travel. And uh, only now gradually some of the airlines are beginning to resume their uh, do domestic flights. Um, consumption. Um, evidently in the past four months, we've seen a, a total breakdown on, on consumption. Uh, there was no demand. Uh, consumers aren't buying. Um, how much did, did each of you buy in, in, the, in the past uh, four months or I, uh, except uh, my um, uh, groceries and, and, and similar things, the water bill maybe. <laughs> but um, um, so uh, that has had a tremendous impact uh, uh, on, on the companies, on the retail sectors. Um, and, uh, and so that will now have to resume and we, that's the big test. Uh, will the consumer uh, in Indonesia, in Europe, again start spending their money? Uh, or will they be cautious and say, yeah, let me save it for uh, whatever comes uh, tomorrow? So it's a very psychological thing um, and um, uh, that's uh, psychologically determined decisions that, uh, that will make these, uh, uh, govern these, uh, these decisions. Uh, just one example uh, from Europe, the European car industry, um, it lost the sale of an estimated 2.6 million cars. Uh, 2.6 million cars not sold because of the crisis. And, and in, in money terms, it's 66 billion euros now calculate that on your uh, iphone uh, to see how much it is a rupiah <laughs> uh, but this is of course a massive impact and and it just shows that um, how how necessary it is 
uh, to for governance um, to uh, create an economic and a health uh, context uh, in which uh, consumers are starting to go back to the shops and uh, uh, purchase uh, the consumer goods, including cars, uh, that they have not been buying uh, for uh, three to four or five months. Um, a last point on the financial system and, uh, and the capital markets, uh, critical sector for any economy. Um, the, the financial system is where it went wrong um, uh, 11 years ago in the financial crisis. Um, now, we haven't seen uh, the type of uh, uh, breakdown uh, that we saw then. Uh, there's not been the meltdown of a number of uh, large banks uh, uh, in, um, uh, like in 2008 and 2009 in the United States, in Europe and elsewhere. Uh, so that's, that's good, and that is, uh, I think, uh, attributable uh, to the work that governments globally, uh, particularly in the G20 context and the OECD, have done uh, to uh, strengthen the governance systems and the regulatory systems for the banking sector and the capital market sector. So that is a, a good thing and, and uh, something to, to uh, absolutely to uh, to be preserved. Um, but there is impacts uh, as a result of the crisis, of course, at the level of the individual uh, borrowers. People can't pay back their loans or their mortgages uh, because they're out of work uh, or are, have been put on un unemployment part time, etc. Uh, so the banks will have to um, uh, deal with that. Um, the capital markets, the stock exchanges, have shown tremendous swings, um, scary uh, for uh, 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 the individual investor who wants to put his, his or her money uh, there, uh, the savings that you have. Uh, it's very, very, of course, uh, normal to be risk averse in these circumstances and to invest uh, your money, your savings in, in very secure uh, uh, papers like um, uh, government bonds uh, in particular. And, um, and that, is, that is good, that is safe, but of course, uh, investing in the government bond, uh, each rupiah invested there, or each euro invested there, is not a, a rupiah or a euro invested in the, directly in the productive economy. It comes back at some point, but um, that only with some delay. Uh, so uh, we have, in other words, uh, as governments, as uh, financial regulators, as central banks, uh, to create a, a, a context in which um, the capital markets uh, return to some normalcy uh, and in which um, uh, investors, whether it's the big investors or the, the small ones, um, uh, are returning uh, to investments in, in the productive uh, um, um, economy. So those are the ballpark figures. Um, um, just a couple of words, the clock is running. Yeah, I will stop. Please um, be a moderator, stop me after five minutes, wherever I am. And um, um, <clears throat> about things that the EU has been doing uh, um, uh, to uh, soften the blow of, um, of the, uh, the COVID-19 crisis. And um, I think the bottom, one of the bottom lines was um, to try to avoid permanent damage uh, as a result of the pandemic uh, for our firms uh, to uh, keep them um, uh, afloat, to protect them uh, while the crisis lasted, uh, to give them uh, the sort of lending and, uh, um, and, and sources to uh, access to lending um, to money uh, that they needed to uh, to stay um, stay alive. Um, so uh, that's there's been tremendous amounts of um, money made available by the uh, by the EU budget, um, close to six hundred and seventy billion euros uh, for that sort of work, and uh, with a focus on on a number of sectors that. Uh, were very, very hard hit 
uh, by the crisis. Um, aviation is one, um, transport in general is one, uh, tourism is one, the whole culture and entertainment sector is, um, is, is one. Um, so um, all of them uh, are uh, large employers um, in, in, in Europe. Uh, tourism, for instance, employs 27 million people um, throughout Europe, and not just in the in the sunny south uh, of Europe, but everywhere. Uh, 27 million jobs are at stake here, and uh, so that is a vital, vital uh, strategic concern. So keeping those companies, the hotels, the restaurants um, uh, alive, uh, protecting the jobs ever was key. Um, in um, logistics, a um, couple of things. There were specific packages uh, adopted uh, for, um, for aviation, for uh, the rail sector, for the maritime sector, for um, inland uh, navigation, uh, for a road um, as well, um, to try and make sure that no particular sector was uh, particular, is, is going to be hit particularly badly and um, to make sure that uh, in the, in the overall transport infrastructure uh, remains uh, intact uh, through, through the crisis. So that is something that's ha happening now and, and this of course involves uh, our relations with, with Indonesia uh, in transport. Uh, there's a, right now I think only one maybe not completely right, one or two um, airlines uh, that have direct flights from Europe on, uh, on, uh, on Indonesia, particularly Jakarta uh, in, in, uh, as, a, as the main hub. And uh, of course, that is something that it shows how little uh, communication, how little um, um, uh, travel there has been uh, between uh, our countries and and something that we need to restore. Um, but think also about the uh, maritime transport sector, global maritime transport sector, where thousands and thousands of uh, seafarers from all, all over the place, but many, of course, uh, from the, the classical um, uh, labor uh, supply countries uh, for maritime uh, transport, um, and that includes uh, Indonesia as well as Philippines. Many of those seafarers are, are blocked in ports uh, because the, the crisis has uh, essentially rendered them uh, um, uh, unemployable uh, uh, for, for firms and uh, for their, their, their ships, and they're unable to get back home uh, from the countries wherever they are. So that is a, a essential problem uh, on which the EU is trying to promote uh, a global solution um, with all the countries that are particularly um, uh, affected by this, uh, this issue. Um, consumption, uh, I've mentioned that before, but uh, what has the EU done uh, to try and prop up uh, consumption? Um, essentially by uh, income subsidies, um, uh, paid by uh, from the EU budget via the uh, the member states um, social systems uh, to uh, uh, to um, individual households um, uh, to have make sure that they have a little bit of extra cash uh, uh, to spend, especially if they were unemployed. Um, the EU has also supported schemes by member states uh, for uh, job subsidies, basically then. In that case, companies are being subsidized by the governments of member states uh, to um, retain uh, the, uh, the jobs. And uh, that is something, of course, that uh, has happened for a couple of months. But, of course, at some point in time, um, you have to end that. And then we hope very much and aim uh, that the, uh, uh, the resumption of the economy uh, will bring back uh, people uh, into jobs um, uh, over, over time, uh, some soon, but uh, some a little bit later. So we will have to face uh, the question, how, what do we do? In the meantime, can we continue to subsidize and at what, uh, what level? 
Um, I close with uh, one point that um, uh, uh, relates to Indonesia and relates to the EU's uh, um, steadfast conviction and determination uh, to keep our markets open. Um, I've mentioned a multilateral system, um, but of course, uh, at the same time, the EU has, is, has elaborated and continues uh, to elaborate a whole network of um, bilateral trade agreements with, with key partners. And that brings me to uh, Indonesia. Um, we are uh, convinced uh, that uh, um, uh, further trade integration and investment integration uh, between the EU and Indonesia it remains the way forward. Uh, that, in other words, there remains a tremendous gain to be earned uh, by the negotiation of our comprehensive economic partnership agreement, the SEPA agreement. It's, it's a, tr a trade agreement, a free trade agreement, with a number of additional elements in it uh, on state aids, on anti-subsidy, on um, governance, on standards, on intellectual property and government procurement um, that go, uh, elements that go over and above uh, the simple free trade agreements. Uh, so um, we uh, uh, are determined to get ahead. In fact, uh, this week and last week we had a series of um, uh, video conferences uh, between the, uh, the Indonesian government and uh, the European Commission in Brussels uh, to push um, push the uh, the talks further in the various uh, chapters, and uh, we hope that um, uh, in uh, the second part of this year um, we can again uh, stage a, a full scale uh, negotiation uh, round um, uh, on these SEPA. Uh, talks. We have just one point uh, relating trade to growth. Uh, we have um, in, um, um, uh, done uh, impact studies um, before we started the negotiation, so it's a bit, uh, a couple of years old, but um, back then uh, we can, uh, the uh, economists who did this uh, outside the European Commission, independent people, um, <coughs> calculated that uh, um, the FTA, the SEPA FTA, uh, would benefit both um, the EU and, uh, and Indonesia. Uh, extra GDP growth uh, as a result of a, uh, a successful uh, agreement. Um, the interesting thing was uh, that um, in percentage terms, um, um, Indonesia stands to gain more. Uh, then does uh, the EU, and um, and that is reflected also in the in the absolute value terms of uh, Indonesian gains uh, from the uh, uh, from the SEPA. Um, uh, the calculation is that by the year 2032, so uh, once everything has kicked into place and and the companies have really started to uh, to get uh, results out of the uh, uh, agreement in 2032. Uh, Indonesia would gain an extra uh, two million, sorry, two billion, up to three point two billion uh, euros extra GDP growth, uh, extra GDP um, as a result of the uh, the, uh, the, uh, the SEPA agreement. So a major, major economic benefit uh, for the economy as a whole, but for jobs in in, in particular. Last word, the green economy. Um, EU is convinced that our recovery has to go hand in hand uh, with uh, our green economy. Uh, we have on the table a uh, very ambitious green deal, uh, that's what it's called. Uh, the policy framework was launched uh, last December and we are now busy rolling out and discussing with member states, of course. Um, the various uh, tools, the various uh, measures uh, to do that. And um, our goal um, is uh, to make uh, the uh, EU economy truly green and circular by 2050. 
and to make it carbon neutral by 2015. So not a, a gram of CO2 uh, going out uh, or uh, out of our economy on a net basis. Now, no easy task, uh, very difficult, challenging. Uh, it covers all policy areas, of course, industry, energy, um, uh, transport, agriculture, uh, finance, uh, green finance, and uh, uh, many other fields. And um, uh, But we are convinced that, uh, yes, we have to get out of the economic crisis caused by the virus, uh, but uh, getting out of this crisis has to go hand in hand with the greening uh, of the uh, economy and pursuing our uh, strategic uh, uh, green uh, objectives. Um, that's our goal for Europe. Um, of course, climate change is a global problem. Uh, you, we can't solve that in Europe uh, alone. Uh, uh, we are 20% of the global economy, but only 8 or 9% of global emissions. So many emissions come from elsewhere. So if we want to do a serious job, if we want to have a really impact and success, uh, we have to work globally and reach out to partners outside uh, Europe. And for that, evidently, um, Indonesia is a, for us, a prime candidate. Uh, we hope to build up with Indonesia a truly green partnership um, that uh, aspires uh, to the same goals or similar goals um, as, as, uh, as ours at home. Uh, of course, adapted to the uh, Indonesian circumstances, the economy, and the, the natural characteristics of, uh, of this beautiful country. I stop there. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much, Ambassador. Uh, so Ambassador Paquette stated that with all of the the emphasis the EU has actually done tremendous work in helping the global. And now I'm sure our students, Ambassador, have many questions they would like to ask. So let's go ahead and dive into our question and answer session. So I will be taking three questions per batch, which will then be answered by Ambassador Paquette before moving on to the next batch. So in this first batch, you can, uh, to ask your question, you can use the raise hand feature on your Zoom app by clicking participants and selecting raise hand on the bottom right and I will be randomly selecting from those who have raised their hands. So to ask your questions, please raise your hand. Okay, for the first question, we'll take from <coughs> Muhammad Rizki Ayman. Please state your name and your question, but please do limit it to one question per person. Please. Um, okay, my name is Muhammad Rizki Ayman from uh, University of Indonesia. First of all, I want to say uh, thank you for Ambassador Pickett for uh, the insight. And I realized that you mentioned about the 2008-2009 uh, financial crisis. And recently I just read that some economists say that um, there is a difference between the 08 financial crisis and our current COVID-19 crisis. And some of them say that it is easier for us today to handle the crisis uh, compared to the 08 financial crisis. The difference is because there is no underlying or fundamental economic issues today. For example, in 08, we have the housing bubble problem and supply shock from the oil price. And to, to the, today crisis, COVID-19 crisis, we don't have that. So what's your take on that? And is there any difference on how we handle or how European Union handle our current crisis compared to 08 financial crisis? Uh, that's my question. Thank you. Oh. All right. Thank you. Uh, now I'll go ahead and take the second question for this batch. We have uh, Aldi Kurniawan from UI. Okay. Uh, thank you for the opportunity. Um, I would like to ask uh, Mr. Vincent about how EU government protect the interest of foreign investors from the loss wrecked by, wreck by COVID-19 pandemic. Are there uh, any policies or program in regards to recover the loss of investors in order to maintain the interest of foreign investors? 
Thank you. Thank you. And for the last question of the batch, we'll take Muhammad Dafa from UPNVJ. Thank you, uh, Your Excellency. Uh, my question uh, is regarding the first wave. Uh, we are facing the many major crises, especially in healthcare and economy. And there are in your presentation, you're saying that will be a second wave of the coronavirus. Uh, and we are face, uh, I believe that will be a major economic uh, crisis uh, in the second wave. And what's your take on the regional cooperation, especially in regional organizations like EU or ASEAN, facing the economy itself? Uh, will it be stronger the relation between the countries for facing the common enemy, the COVID, or it will be in the other hand, destroying the relation between countries, uh, such uh, uh, for uh, regarding the uh, the COVID nineteen? Thank you. Thank you. So I'll hand over the floor to Ambassador Pickett to answer these dispatch. Thank, thank you. Thanks very much. Um, first of all, in reply to Mohammed Risky, um, you know, um, I think I would subscribe to the same assessment um, that you have quoted that um, this crisis is unprecedented and it doesn't have the same characteristics at all um, uh, as uh, of the, um, uh, the financial crisis of 2009. Um, it's, um, it isn't a financial crisis uh, to start with. Uh, it's a crisis that is uh, uh, pandemic. Uh, we haven't had anything like this uh, for as long as humans can remember uh, history. Um, uh, so um, it has a, an impact uh, on the economy uh, that is much deeper potentially uh, than the financial crisis and uh, it has a, an impact on, on life, human life, societies um, that is totally different uh, than uh, uh, during the financial crisis. Um, nobody during the financial crisis was uh, forced to spend uh, three, four months uh, indoors, um, basically, except for grocery shopping. Um, so that is one indicator. And uh, the key thing now um, is uh, um, to make sure that uh, we arm ourselves, that, that is, first of all, that we keep or bring the pandemic under control. Uh, we won't managed to get rid of it altogether. Uh, the virus is still around. We have no vaccine. Uh, so we have, we remain vulnerable uh, for foreseeable time. Uh, but that's a, a simple fact for each and every one of us, uh, wherever you are. Uh, it's, it's in Europe, in Indonesia, in the United States, uh, in, in New Zealand. Um, so um, keep, the, the crisis on the pandemic under control. And secondly, um, uh, see how quickly uh, and how responsibly you can reopen the economy. And, and that is um, the debate that each and every country has at the present moment in Europe um, and in Indonesia. Europe, we are maybe a bit advanced in that regard uh, since the uh, uh, the, co uh, the infection uh, uh, statistics uh, have, uh, have improved markedly. Um, in Indonesia, uh, it's maybe slightly, uh, slightly uh, later, but, but it's the same notion. So reopening responsibly the, the economy to avoid permanent damage uh, to companies, uh, to the um, infrastructure of the economy, uh, the the economic fabric of your, of, of your country uh, and to uh, to jobs um, and household income, uh, avoiding that people go bankrupt uh, and uh, 
uh, run out of money and, and have to go to the uh, social institutions to, uh, to get uh, some, some food every day. So that, that is what, what the, the, the crunch question, the crunch task now. Um, money helps, of course. Uh, um, today, I read uh, what I think is a very uh, uh, appropriate tool um, um, here in Indonesia. Uh, with um, uh, the central bank uh, providing uh, extra finance uh, to uh, to banks uh, to allow them to lend um, uh, to give them liquidity for lending uh, and to allow them to lend uh, at lower uh, interest rates. Um, I think that's a very pragmatic uh, uh, tool uh, of uh, of um, of dealing with the issue of uh, liquidity, of um, cash flow uh, at the level of companies, at the level of households, uh, to, um, uh, to make it, uh, uh, to get over this, this, this crisis right now. So I do th indeed think that there's quite a difference um, between today's crisis and the one of 10, 12 years ago. Uh, however, the bottom line remains the same, and that is we have to uh, create the climate for the economy to resume in the best possible ways uh, with one big difference and that is I think as I mentioned in my in my talk um, the financial institutions in uh, most uh, G20 countries if not all uh, are a lot stronger now than they were uh, in, uh, in 2008, 2009. In other words they are now better play, able to play the role of their intermediary uh, function of, of lending for uh, for the economy. Um, the question from uh, Aldi uh, Kunaiva, I can't read my handwriting. Uh, uh, protection of foreign investors, what do we do? Um, you know, um, in principle, the EU makes no distinction between investors in general or foreign investors. Um, uh, as I said, our economy is a very open one, probably the most open one in the world, and we will remain so, and that's my um, uh, conviction. Um, so an investor from Indonesia in Europe or a, uh, uh, an investor from any of the uh, uh, domestic uh, uh, investors uh, from any, in any of the member states, they have this, are entitled to exactly the same uh, rights and obligation as a foreign, as, a, as, a, as an economic actor. Uh, so there's no particular uh, uh, immunities. Um, maybe there's a tax break or here and there, but but no immunities. Uh, uh, the same um, uh, obligations to uh, uh, apply the um, regulatory system, uh, and also the same protection in case um, uh, things go wrong. Uh, protection by uh, the court, protection by the, uh, the criminal uh, legislation in case of crime, um, and uh, protection um, by um, um, insurance systems for the, uh, for the stock markets or for the, uh, the deposit of bank accounts, etc. Et so, so I think that's a pretty level playing field. Uh, we are wary of, uh, of um, uh, of rogue investors, uh, of unfair investors, uh, of uh, unfair uh, um, takeovers uh, of our firms. Uh, that's a, a new reality. Uh, we, we didn't bother about it for a long time, but we have learned that we have to, and, and we will uh, take care of it. So in that sense, we are protecting ourselves the not um, uh, against investors in general, but against a particular kind of investment. And that is what we want to uh, uh, do in order to keep uh, the economic fabric uh, of the EU uh, intact. Um, the third question from uh, Mohamed uh, Daffel. Can uh, Regional cooperation help um, uh, deal with a crisis like this. Cooperation within a region, like within ASEAN, or um, 
uh, within uh, EU. Um, absolutely. Um, you know, um, and, and the question, of course, came up at some point. You, I'm talking about the EU now. Um, you know, what's 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 the EU doing uh, on, on this? And and um, uh, and that's a that's a good question. Uh, and at the start, it, it is clear we were not ready uh, for this uh, crisis. Uh, late February, early March this year, we were not, and uh, nobody was. Um, so we had to uh, make a long way in, in getting uh, into uh, a mode that um, met our capabilities and that met the needs. And that is, of course, an, a difficult uh, task. Uh, uh, the EU as international uh, entity cannot do everything. It's, it's not mandated to do some uh, everything. Uh, member states have their own responsibilities. Public health is a member state responsibility, not an EU responsibility, for instance. Um, so we have to we had to seek the added, added value and, and find it in um, in uh, concrete proposals. Now, what we did is I think a couple of topics. First of all, uh, we raised tremendous amounts of funding for the particular the most hurt member states. Uh, to deal with the immediate crisis and also to deal with the added economic impact that money uh, 400 sorry 540 billion euros is now under implementation uh, and uh, and uh, uh, so we're beginning to show results um, secondly um, we took a number of decisions for the eu economy as a whole uh, to soften the blow um, of the impact. Um, example, um, in international aviation, airlines uh, that do not use their slots um, lose these slots in airports. Now, of course, nobody was flying. And um, uh, of course, we had to protect uh, the, uh, the airlines against uh, losing slots. Uh, because next thing that would happen is that somebody from somewhere would start buying up these slots and um, and uh, uh, later sell them again in order, in other words, turn them into um, uh, a speculative uh, commodity. Uh, one example how we protected firms. Um, a second example is <coughs> a decision that was taken just na yesterday, um, a um, permission uh, to the banks uh, in the European Union uh, to lower uh, a tiny little bit, not much, but a little bit, um, uh, the capital adequacy ratio. And it's very technical, but it's the, the amount of capital that a bank needs to keep in its own coffers uh, and uh, in order to have a, a reserve for in case something goes wrong. Now, if you lower that ratio by half a percent, uh, uh, then, of course, you create tremendous financial space uh, for uh, the whole of the EU European economy. And uh, that is precisely uh, uh, what we did. Uh, we lowered uh, the, uh, um, uh, the uh, cost of, uh, of uh, lending for banks and at the same time uh, passing that on to, to the consumer. So very concrete terms, uh, decisions that we put in place. And... Um, not to speak of um, the joint action we've had and uh, the uh, external uh, assistance uh, to third countries uh, on uh, fighting cybercrime, fighting disinformation, uh, and uh, on uh, protecting uh, the internal borders. Uh, so closing the, bo the borders temporarily, but at the same time making sure uh, that there were green lanes for uh, uh, for goods, uh, for transport, uh, for trade, and for border crossing uh, uh, employment. Um, so it does work. And if you simply also try to think, uh, would think away, just make that mental experiment, uh, just try to imagine that there was no European Union. I, I tried it. Uh, 
Uh, would, would individual member states be better off? Not at all. Uh, not at all. I think we would have been much more vulnerability and, uh, than uh, there is now. Uh, it would have been much uh, a longer track uh, to get back um, uh, uh, in a recovery mode. And, and thirdly, uh, there would have been um, much less clout uh, for you individual member states uh, in the international um, sphere uh, to uh, defend our, our interests on topics like disinformation, uh, you know, hostile takeovers, unfair takeovers, and, and, and the like. Now, EU is very advanced in its integration, much more so than is ASEAN. It's going in similar orientations, but in a different way, like the ASEAN way. And uh, uh, so uh, the benefits, um, if one were to study it, uh, would, would be an interesting thing to do. Um, what, what were uh, the benefits uh, of, the, of the ASEAN uh, for um, uh, the individual member states of ASEAN? I'm sure that uh, people more knowledgeable than I uh, would be able to do that and uh, and come to the conclusions also for uh, how to uh, orient or reorient or boost uh, the ASEAN scope of action. And uh, as EU, we have a lot of confidence in ASEAN. Um, we uh, want to partner with it. It's a, a like-minded uh, organization, a like-minded union. Um, as is the, uh, the European Union. Uh, so uh, we are tremendously supportive uh, of uh, its, its development uh, in all respects, in, uh, whether it's from the economy to uh, the green agenda to um, uh, defence dialogue, uh, etc. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador. Uh, now it looks here that we have a lot of students lined up for questions. So Ambassador, do you mind if we take uh, four questions at a time? All right. Uh, our first student, we have Jenny Sariwinata from UPH. Please state your name and your question. Thank you for the opportunity. My name is Jenny. So my question is relating to the relation or if I could say joint response between the European countries, between the EU and, the, and those that are not within the EU. So is there any crucial differences or burdens, if I could say, in terms of the framework in, res in response to the COVID-19 between the EU internally and the whole and the European countries as a whole that have caused an extra challenge in times like this maybe? Yeah, that was my question. Thank you. Thank you, Jenny. Now for our second question, we'll take from UI, Yofan Gabriel Kosasi. Hi, okay. Um, thank you for the opportunity. So my question is regarding, um, so you mentioned various policies that has been implemented in order to solve the economic crisis. Uh, but in particular, I've read about uh, the policy implemented in Denmark in which the country decided to nationalize the payroll. So my question is whether or not this type of policy is feasible for other European countries, because it seems like it's a much better idea to for the country to actually pay the employer rather than handling it out to individual individual corporates. So uh, yeah, my question is whether or not it will be feasible for other EU members and whether or not it will be feasible for Indonesia. Thank you. All right. Uh, thank you. Our next question, uh, we have Mudita Sandi from UPH. Good afternoon, Your Excellency and everyone. Thank you very much for the opportunity. I'm very delighted. Um, so I would like to ask about uh, the EU's recovery plan for EU itself. But first, I would like to clarify first, if that's okay, so we could clear any misunderstanding, if there's any possible misunderstanding. So. Um, uh, the EU's recovery plan uh, needs a joint debt by the EU state members. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. So uh, there are countries in the EU states that are hit harder than the others uh, by this pandemic. And by adding this debt to their plate could possibly increase their burden, which could halt their decision making. And so agreeing in this joint debt for the recovery plan. And I would like to ask, how would EU respond to this issue? Thank you very much. OK, 
Okay, thank you, Mudita. And now for our last question for this batch, uh, we have Michael Jason from UI. Thank you for the opportunity and good afternoon, everyone. And once again, thank you for the presentation regarding the economic impact towards the EU. I would like to ask a question regarding different aspects other than the economy, that is regarding the security. As we know, the budgets of most nations or institutions are currently focused on tackling the COVID-19. Is there any direct or indirect impact towards the European security integration due to this pandemic? For example, before, uh, we already hear regarding talk of possibility of the creation of the European army, which is quite a highlight because of Macron and supports the creation of the state army. But however, we do not hear much about it since the COVID-19 pandemic hit hard. So what are the impacts regarding this pandemic towards the European security integration? Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you, Michael. I'll hand the floor back over to Ambassador Vincent. Thanks, Thanks very much uh, for interesting questions. Uh, quite a lot of ground <laughs> to cover, but uh, I'll have a go. I'll try to be concise um, so that uh, <clears throat> now the, the, the uh, the first question from from uh, from from Jenny uh, about the uh, um, the juxtaposition of internal and external um, interests and uh, of uh, um, uh, interests within uh, the EU from different member states and and how that uh, how that translates into our, our external response. You know, um, first of all. Yes, we have 27 member states, uh, different sizes, different political histories, uh, different um, uh, partnerships um, uh, out of history uh, uh, in, 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 the, in the global arena, um, different um, outlooks uh, and so on. Uh, so you have a diversity of, um, of um, of ideas uh, among member states, of interests uh, to some extent, and that is that is important. Yeah? That's, then you have to recognize it, and and uh, the challenge for the EU, but also the uh, the uh, opportunity for the EU uh, is uh, to um, to weld uh, those different interests and perspectives into something uh, that is commonly agreeable and effective uh, that uh, meets the standard of common uh, interests, uh, can be signed up to by member states, supported, adhered to and paid for uh, at the end of the day. That's the European member states taxpayers that by and large pay the EU budget. Um, so that's challenge is always there uh, about uh, the different uh, um, interests <coughs> now in external in internal policies uh, i think um, by and large uh, there's a very high degree of consensus uh, about um, what the eu should be doing not everything is clear of course and there are debates about several topics we come to one uh, the third question um, uh, mudita uh, is about that. Um, uh, so, um, but all in, all in all, by and large, uh, it works. It has worked and it has helped the EU uh, grow stronger and stronger uh, year after year. And, uh, and, um, and uh, nothing can be taken for granted. We have to nurture, to preserve, to develop and uh, not fall asleep, uh, evidently. Uh, but um, now externally, um, there is for me absolutely no doubt whatsoever that um, if you manage to uh, bring together these different interests and traditions and perspectives into something that is common, uh, that is called the EU, that your voice in the world, uh, your influence in the world, your clout, if you like, in the world um, is so much stronger than if you stand on your own as 
uh, individual member state. Example, um, last Monday, uh, EU-China summit. Um, look it up on the website of the EU. Uh, big, big, big partners, uh, major partners. The, the EU is the number one trade partner of China and China is the number two trade partner for the EU. So tremendous, tremendous economic uh, interests on both sides. Um, many things we see eye to eye. Um, um, so that's, that's a very strong basis. At the same time, we have a number of very serious problems uh, with China um, in the economy, in uh, getting access to the market, in um, you know, uncompetitive behavior in the global marketplace, including in the EU, um, on values, human rights. We disagree fundamentally with some of the things that China does uh, at home. And we want to speak out uh, when that is uh, uh, the case. Um, um, and, uh, uh, and similar things now. Do you think that an international, in, in this big uh, arena, uh, an individual member state could have raised such topics effectively um, with China? I don't think so. Not even the biggest member states. Uh, but with, as a EU, 450 million inhabitants, um, the second largest economy in the world, if you take us as a bloc, um, and the first trade partner uh, with, uh, with China, for China, we can, we have that uh, strength. So I think there's a major gain there uh, that we can um, leverage our strength uh, on the global uh, the coherence of the, of, uh, of the EU uh, in an, a major partnership like we have with, uh, with China. It's a strong partnership, as I said, uh, but also uh, we have written it down in papers. Um, there is a, what we call a systemic rivalry uh, between China and, uh, and the EU. And uh, we cannot be ignorant of that. We cannot be naive about it. Uh, we have to deal, with, to deal with it face to face. And, uh, and that's what we do. Look at the, uh, uh, the statements by the uh, EU presidents last uh, last Monday, and it is all a bit, you know, press language, a bit polished here and there. But behind the words, you will read what I what I say. Um, Joran Kosasi, um, very interesting question, I think, um, uh, about the role of the governments role of the state in the economy post-COVID. Um, it's very, <laughs> absolutely, what is absolutely sure and clear is that in the crisis, uh, governments, including the EU, have been doing things they had never thought of doing before um, in terms of what they fund uh, in, in society, putting uh, basically paying people their salaries, taking over the salary bill of, of companies, uh, income subsidies for households. Uh, uh, Germany paid uh, 500 euros uh, per child for each, ho uh, each household, 500 euros per, per child, just, just like that. Um, and um, managing, uh, raising money, uh, the, you know, the EU, uh, uh, has been guaranteeing loans and, and taking loans in a way that we've never done before. And, and the, the, the upshot of it is that uh, the, the, the role of the state in the EU economy in this very private, socially regulated, <coughs> um, highly privatized economy has grown a lot. Um, uh, so uh, the Central European Central Bank has been uh, selling bonds, uh, billions and billions worth of bonds. I forget the amount now, I think it's about 400 billion euros worth of bonds um, uh, to, to private banks and to governments. So um, 
And we have to reflect on it. And what do we want to do with that? Is, is that some uh, the, the new more normal in economic policy uh, for us? Um, um, I don't have the answer, uh, but it is certainly something we, 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 we need to see face to face and see how we move on from here. Uh, certain is that some things we cannot continue doing uh, continuously. We cannot continue subs subsidizing the, you know, um, jobs in, in firms. Uh, that, that's not how we work. That is, that it goes to it's a totally different mode of economy than than is is than our legal uh, and uh, economic framework is is, is about. So, um, uh, so we do it now. Uh, we will phase it out. The question is how we do that with, uh, you know, uh, minimal pain for uh, the persons concerned, and um, by maintaining some um, uh, viability in the uh, in the in our public finance, because that's another factor, of course. Um, all governments have been overshooting uh, the uh, uh, the macroeconomic criteria for the for the euro and for our uh, stability pact, the, the tax the tax levels and the indebted levels and so on, uh, public debts and uh, budget deficit. So we have to um, strike a new agreement with the member states to get back uh, to uh, the situation as it used to be, as we had foreseen it. Maybe it will never come back. I don't know, but that's the um, uh, the debate. Uh, Mudira Saudi, if, if I write it, wrote as well, uh, the recovery plan for Europe, very topical. Yeah, I don't know if everybody knows what the, the question is about, but uh, three weeks ago, I believe, um, the uh, the president of the European Commission. Um, um, uh, launched this plan uh, of 750 billion injection uh, euros injection into uh, the economy, um, partly based on uh, on the borrowing by the European Commission uh, at a level we've never done before, partly based on income generated by uh, uh, new uh, uh, tax taxation sources. Uh, uh, um, and um, um, why is it um, a difficult uh, debate? Or, or, you know, it's because a uh, it is doing things at, a, at in a new way at a, at a new level. Um, we've never seen anything like this before. Um, b uh, that's uh, because. Um, in the past, when we when the EU borrowed money in order to um, you know, address economic needs of member states, um, we always lent the money to member states in the form of loans, loan lending. Um, here, however, part of the money we would be giving to member states uh, borrowed money for grants, so no payback. Um, now, that is a, you know, economically a uh, uh, a, um, a new uh, dimension, and can only work if the EU develops new sources of income elsewhere. Now, that so, in other words, you have uh, an economic principle connected with a budget principle that needs to be redefined. And last thing, it is difficult because of it's, it's the, the the frequent question: uh, who gets the money and on what terms? Uh, how do you determine the allocations for country and member state X compared to Y uh, compared to Z? Um, what criteria? And um, here there's a um, you know uh, debates uh, as well. Uh, so um, I think the question is uh, of course important for um, for uh, the activity as such, and it, it's uh, f from our point of view as EU representatives, certainly something that is uh, we consider absolutely needed uh, to give the European economy the boost uh, that it needs um, uh, for getting out of uh, the tremendous crisis. Um, secondly, um, it is connected with a, a redesign of the, the way in which the EU is funded. Um, so. 
less a model of um, um, of contributions, direct contributions from member states, in, and more towards a an own capacity of, for the EU uh, to uh, source um, income um, uh, from from other sources. So I think that is uh, uh, that is certainly a a new uh, dimension, and it's very. This is a very hot debate, and it's 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 hard. It's very needed to have it now. Um, we will have in uh, July uh, another summit of the heads of state and, and government uh, of the 27 member states um, where this will be discussed. Uh, it will be the first summit uh, since February, I think, uh, where the leaders will meet in person uh, in Brussels. And, um, and we need decisions now because uh, the money uh, uh, the decisions have to be Im implemented from the 1st of January 2021. So there's uh, very little time uh, left uh, to uh, agree the parameters for uh, for the big budget uh, decisions of, uh, of next year and the years after. Um, the last question from uh, Michael Jasson. Jasson. Uh, um, um, about security integration. Um, <clears throat> now, a couple of days ago, um, the uh, EU's high representative for foreign policy and security policy and defense uh, published a very interesting blog. His name is uh, Joseph Borrell, um, published a, a very interesting blog. It's on, on the website of the, um, of the EU um, uh, uh, under the title Rough Seas. Uh, Rough Seas. Now, basically what he writes there is that uh, the, the old uh, traditional parameters of uh, of the world order have, 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 have gone uh, or have transformed uh, to an extent that um, that we can't uh, work on those parameters any longer. And um, uh, it's about uh, China, it's about the United States, about uh, uh, Russia, of course. And um, But um, it does mean uh, that uh, for the high representative that the EU um, has to uh, develop a larger a defense uh, and military identity and um, to work out new relations with the member states um, to make that reality happen and uh, to position ourselves in, in a new way in, uh, in, uh, in global defense, security and military affairs. Um, it doesn't mean giving up um, the North Atlantic Alliance, not at all. Um, many of our member states, the large majority, are members of NATO. Um, uh, the relationship with the United States will, will stay, um, uh, of course, uh, but uh, there is a, a need for uh, a stronger European uh, identity uh, uh, of its own in the eyes of defense, military, security. Now, um, those of you who have followed this a little bit um, will be, probably agree with what I say when I say that over the past five years alone, um, a lot has changed, a lot has been decided, uh, much more than in the past 20 years or whatever uh, before that, in terms of um, uh, developing common and joint uh, capabilities. Um, setting up um, research, defense research, military research uh, funds for common research, joint procurement um, of military hardware, um, uh, formation of, um, uh, of what is called battle groups, um, not to wage wars, but uh, to um, have um, a capability to react quickly if there are crises on our borders and interventions needed uh, rapidly for this or that. Um, and uh, the setup of a um, what is called a peace fund. So a fund that uh, uh, finances the, uh, 
civilian military missions of the EU uh, outside. Uh, there are about, at the present moment, already 30, 25, uh, 25 I believe, uh, of those. Uh, they're financed in a uh, intergovernmental way. Um, at the moment, some member states individually put a little money in, in, uh, in, the, in the accounts, uh, but now the idea would be to give this fund, uh, this operation, a stable uh, funding uh, for uh, years to come. So all of this is happening and it, it is not very exciting. It doesn't hit headlines, uh, fortunately, in a way. Um, it's just um, uh, sustained uh, work on development and, and, and uh, uh, capacity building. Uh, but it is moving and uh, you can expect by the end of this year, uh, December, uh, some, some further uh, decision on this, some new policy papers, strategic papers uh, uh, being published about where the EU um, should or would uh, be positioning itself in, the, in global defense and, uh, and military uh, matters. It's an area on which we, in, by, incidentally, uh, we wish to cooperate and we have been cooperating with, uh, with Indonesia. Uh, very hands-on, uh, uh, very straightforward cooperation uh, with the Defence Academy uh, of the uh, Ministry of, uh, of Defence. Some exchanges, uh, trainings, people going to Brussels, Brussels people coming here. Um, also participation by Indonesia, uh, by two ships of uh, in Indonesian Navy uh, in the, uh, the large um, military operation run by the EU uh, with partners from outside the EU in the, the Gulf of Aden to fight piracy there, one of the most successful anti-piracy uh, operations um, in, in the world. Um, Indonesian ships have uh, on their way to Lebanon uh, where uh, they went uh, or came back from Lebanon where they went for peacekeeping in the UN framework. Um, uh, they uh, joined for temporarily the, uh, the EU military uh, naval mission in the Gulf of Aden. So very, very practical hands-on types of cooperation, which we hope we can elaborate further. <clears throat> All right. Thank you, Ambassador. Uh, I would like to note that it is now 345. I'm wondering if you would like to extend another batch, uh, another four questions. All right. One batch, all right. Uh, so we'll take a question. Let's do LSPR. We have Putri Mustika Saridewi. The floor is yours. Uh, thank you for the opportunity. opportunity. Uh, my name is Putri Mustika Saridewi from LSPR batch 21. Uh, I want to ask for your opinion, Mr. Vincent. Um, how's the condition of the economic sector, sector after COVID-19 and what policies are uh, implemented to carry out uh, cooperation in the economic sector? Thank you. Thank you. And for our second question uh, from Binus, Anissa, Sofia, Ulfa, uh, please keep your questions short. All right. Thank you. Okay. Thank you for the opportunities. Uh, hello, Mr. Ambassador. My name is Anissa Sofielfa and I'm from Minnesota University. Um, with each calamity, there will be an opportunity. It's an old saying about looking at the bright side. Economy, economically speaking, what are the opportunities or innovation you have and can it be implemented to other nations? Thank you. Thank you. Our third question uh, from Upeha Anggi Dwi. Yeah, thank you for the opportunity. My name is Angi Dwi and I'm from FSCI chapter UPH. So uh, from your presentation before, you have mentioned about the recovery plan that EU has been working on. And you also mentioned about the EU will stick and try to man maintain the green economy in order to recover the European economy during this pandemic. And my question is, in your opinion, what approaches or strategies or policies should be implemented by the EU in achieving the recovery plan and the European Green Deal at the same time in the midst of COVID-19? That's it. I hope my question is clear enough. Thank you, Mr. Ambassador. 
Thank you, Anggi. And our final question for today uh, from UI, Joan Dafa No Value. Uh, thank you for the opportunity. Mr. Vincent, before you mentioned that central banks of EU has been lending amount of loan to bank in order to increase the bank liquidity rates, applying a lower loan rates and selling bonds to private and state-owned banks. So my question is short, relating to the policy of banking sector. We believe that the pandemic has been heavily influencing the liquidity rates of banks. So is there any policy for banks having low liquidity rates to consolidate like conducting major and acquisition with the banks having high liquidity rates in order to stabilize the financial system. Uh, if there is such policy, what are the specific criteria determined by the financial authority in order to give order for bank to conduct M&A with another bank? That's it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'll give the floor back to Ambassador mm -hmm. Vincent. All right. Um, now, yeah. Um, question from Putri Mustika Sri Devi. Um, the policy response. I mean, um, in the economic sphere, <coughs> um, separates the emergency crisis uh, responses from the recovery response. Uh, the crisis response was um, uh, to um, release from the EU budget, uh, the EU level budget, um, massive, massive amounts of funding to member states uh, to um, allow member states to uh, support companies, or not companies as such, but salaries basically and uh, in order to help them bridge uh, the, the crisis. Um, we're now in the moving towards the recovery phase. Um, that's where the big um, challenge lies. Um, how do you do a recovery? Uh, first of all, by normalizing uh, uh, the way in which the EU has always functioned with our open borders, free movements, uh, um, uh, etc. cetera. Um, so that is happening now. Um, uh, so that will no doubt uh, help, uh, particularly the logistics sector, uh, the tourism sector, um, uh, to uh, get back into shape. Will the tourist season this year be the same as, as last year? No, it won't, it can't be. Um, but uh, let's try and salvage whatever we can and, and make sure that um, uh, some of the uh, losses can be absorbed. Um, investment, um, European Investment Bank, so not the central bank, the European Central Bank, different, but the European Investment Bank, the largest land development bank in the world, much or much larger than anybody else, ADB, World Bank, whatever, um, has got a loan mandate, a lending mandate uh, from uh, the shareholders, which are the member states, um, for recovery lending, uh, large firms, small firms, um, uh, investment uh, vehicles, uh, etc. Uh, so um, that is where we stand now. Um, all sorts of regulatory procedures have been simplified, relaxed in a way. Example, state aid. The EU has very strict rules about state aid uh, by governance. Uh, in order to keep a, um, a level playing field uh, between the member states if it comes to competition, fair competition, equitable, hence you can't subsidize in one country and, um, and um, uh, if others don't. 
So those rules have been relaxed temporarily and that will stay for a while to allow member states to continue to help uh, companies uh, bridge uh, the crisis. Um, so that's, that's essentially the, the key tools. And, um, um, but one important thing and that comes in, in fact to the, uh, is also my answer to, uh, uh, to the third question from Augie Dui uh, about the link between recovery and green in the economy. Um, now two things, uh, first of all, uh, the EU's proposed uh, green deal is still under discussion. Um, I think that the 27 member states are all on the same page if it comes to the global objectives, but um, the design of the individual steps, the individual measures, uh, the individual laws to make it happen, of course, is some still under discussion. And, and here, there are still debates about this uh, taking place. Why? Uh, because the starting points between member states are different. Um, I think <laughs> the, um, Poland, for instance, is an economy uh, that uh, is heavily reliant on coal. And um, uh, that is part of the, uh, uh, the history of the country uh, from the days when it was still uh, in the, uh, um, within the, the realm of the, of the Soviet Union and the Warsaw Pact. Um, and so and Poland argues for us, there has to be some special accommodation uh, for, because our transition uh, cannot be done can, uh, as quickly uh, in the same way as uh, a country uh, with a different uh, structure of the ener in, in the energy sector. Um, so that is one big debate. Um, um, we believe uh, that we have to help the countries with a different, uh, lower starting point, if you like, um, but we have to help them with a special fund uh, for reinvestment in uh, energy, the energy sector in particular, that's the, I think the, 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 the major crunch um, in order to help them get on the same sort of level as, as countries uh, um, who are more advanced than, uh, in, in this uh, connection, thanks to the fact that their energy structure uh, was uh, less reliant on, on coal. So, um, so Green Deal is still under discussion. That was my first point. My second point is I'm convinced that this will come. Um, uh, and why? Uh, because opinion poll, after opinion poll, amongst at the EU level, huh? EU 27, um, should the EU do more about climate, uh, green, sustainability, and so on? 60%, 65, 70, uh, and so on. And that translates, that opinion, popular opinion, translates into politics, in, in voting behavior, um, in the national parliaments, in the European Parliament. And for instance, the European Parliament election of last May, the Greens made a big gain. And that's one. Secondly, within other parties, like the, the Christian Democrats and the uh, social Democrats and the liberals, the Greens have also made gains. Uh, or greening, the topic of greening has also made gains. This will continue. And we will see that reflected in all our policies systematically. Um, the big ones, but also the small policies. And um, example, um, it's a big one, <laughs> as a matter of fact, the SEPA with, between the EU and Indonesia. Um, it has a chapter on trade and sustainable development. Um, why? Partly it's, you know, ideology. ideology. Uh, we want to support SDGs. Uh, we want to avoid that um, trade uh, leads to 
the plundering of, of an economy. Uh, we don't believe in that model. Some countries do. We don't. Um, and um, and it, of course, reflects the, fact, the desire of us to uh, have a green partnership with Indonesia. And I tell you this, that if there's no paragraph on trade and sustainable development in the future SEPA with Indonesia, the European Parliament, but maybe also national parliaments, will vote it down. It will not pass. And um, now, uh, Indonesia has agreed to engage with us on this, so we're starting the debates right now. And we, are, as I said, we are hopeful that we can uh, build up a very ambitious um, package of ideas uh, to that are good for uh, the global goods and the, uh, and the climate in general, but also good for uh, for the Indonesian economy. Because one thing we have learned uh, in our history over the past um, economic history over the past on the EU side uh, over the past um, 30, 40 years is that uh, making your economy greener and cleaner and less reliant on carbon can go hand in hand with creating growth and jobs. Now, that's a lesson we've learned. The figures are there, uh, look them up on the EU website, and we are convinced that the same uh, will apply to, uh, to Indonesia. Um, in a sense, um, uh, I'm looking at the question from Anissa Sofia, uh, the opportunities of the crisis. Um, um, I think that uh, we would say that um, the opportunity is um, that we have come to realize that uh, the way we work, the way we live, the way we run our economies um, is vulnerable. Uh, to shocks um, that we have to look very, very carefully what we can do uh, to avoid a repetition or to be stronger uh, when the repetition uh, happens um, in our private lives, uh, of course, the way we consume as a, an individual citizen, uh, what we buy, how we buy, how we dispose of rubbish, etc. So that is the person level. At the macro level, it's uh, you know, notions like greening economy, focusing on sustainability, avoiding uh, the abuse of natural resources. Um, it's uh, <clears throat> in awareness that I pick up in articles I read. Um, um, and uh, even today in the Jakarta Post, uh, an article about that, about a new awareness of the need for sustainability and uh, about uh, making uh, the use of resources um, uh, more responsible, more future oriented and, and less, uh, um, uh, less uh, destabilizing to the natural environment. So I think that is an, uh, a, a, an opportunity, um, a, a change in mindset probably. Uh, that um, we have to translate as policymakers. I'm not a policymaker, but the policymakers have to uh, translate into, into into ideas or and, and respond to. Um, so I'm, I'm I'm keen to see how that works out here in uh, in Indonesia. Um, then the last question from Joanne Novala. I must admit, Joanne. You're over asking me a little bit <laughs> uh, on, with that, um, uh, with your question about banks' liquidity and uh, <coughs> and uh, how this impacts on the uh, capacity of, uh, of banks uh, to uh, support mergers and acquisitions. Um, this is big stuff, <laughs> and I lack the expertise on it. Um, um, I did mention earlier on um, the new caution uh, that the EU applies uh, to mergers and takeovers. 
uh, if the uh, uh, our, what we uh, expect, the standards that we expect, uh, uh, the equal opportunity and, uh, that we uh, demand uh, is not reflected. Um, the uh, if subsidized firms keep buying up, uh, you know, young startups in, in, in Europe or larger companies in the, in the tech sphere, uh, just like that, and take take the technology, take the intellectual property, and thank you goodbye. And that's not what we want to see. And um, uh, so that is uh, certainly uh, something we will work on. Um, one topic in the summit between the EU and China last Monday was about access to the market for European investors there. Now, think about that. Um, European investors wanting to come to China uh, to invest and create jobs, of course, and earn something, of course, but create jobs, benefits for the um, uh, Chinese economy. It is also difficult uh, to agree a the investment agreement with China. Uh, the market remains very, very closed, and uh, well, the targets have deadlines have sh shifted year after year. And and at a certain moment, you wonder, you know, we open our market for your firms, and how about us? And, and there has to be um, a win-win situation, and. So that sort of question will come up and um, with all our major relations and uh, the EU-China relation is, is it a major one, right? I've said it in terms of size and in terms of political weight and we can do a lot with China in many fields, but in some areas we are just uh, um, way from uh, where we want to be in terms of uh, the reciprocity in the economic sphere, for instance. All right, thank you. Thank you very much, Ambassador. Uh, though we do certainly have a lot of enthusiasm for today's discussion, I think we can cut it there for now. Uh, I'm sure everyone has many questions, but unfortunately we can't take them all because of time constraints. But thank you very much to Ambassador Paquette and thank you to all the students for your questions. Now to provide just some key takeaways from today's lecture, I would like to highlight the following six points. So the first point is that the bi bipolarity of the US and China has affected world politics and economy, and it is also increasing the level of impact of the COVID-19 crisis, such as rising inequalities, hoax and misinformation, as well as weak protection of human rights. Uh, the second point is that global governance system is under pressure. The World Health Organization has also become the center of attention at the time of this pandemic, which also needs to be assessed. And number three is that within the EU itself, EU is trying to solve the problem of political fractions among member states, the access of medical supplies, and also affording relevant budget needs in dealing with the COVID-19 pandemic. The fourth point is to contribute to the global efforts in battling the pandemic, EU has also supported vulnerable regions or countries in the world by giving them millions of euros, including to ASEAN and, and especially to Indonesia. Uh, number five was that in the G20 meeting, the vaccine development has become the focus for all advanced economies in the world, and the EU has joined the global efforts in providing accessible and proper vaccines for COVID-19. And lastly, point number six is that the EU continues its regional cooperation with ASEAN in dealing with the pandemic in many levels of partnership, including budget assistance and uh, for containment measures. And uh, with that, I'd like to ask Ambassador Vincent if you would have any last words or perhaps a closing message for the students before we move on to our quiz. Quick message. Um, thanks, thanks very much for this opportunity. Wonderful to um, have this discussion. Um, sorry, we can't meet in person, but I'm sure that will come. Um, second message, um, thank you to FPCI uh, for this opportunity. Great to have you. And S Cindy, as a moderator and as a summarizer of <laughs> the debate, you're perfect. <laughs> so well done. Um, thirdly, 
stay critical, everybody. Um, think before you agree to what you write, read, uh, to what people, including people like me, tell you. Think critically. Um, if you read the EU bans palm oil, Indonesian palm oil from our market. It's not true, I tell you. Uh, our markets are open. Two billion euros worth of palm oil from Indonesia went to the EU market last year. But you continue to read it, and I have to continue to <laughs> reply to that. So be critical. And lastly, everybody, stay healthy. Be careful. Your individual responsibility, self-discipline matters. It's like in democracy, each vote counts. And in combating the crisis, the behavior of each individual counts. And only by self-discipline, caution, sanitary means, distancing, etc., you will keep uh, and keep uh, this crisis under control. And hopefully be able to get back to something of the new normal uh, before too long. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Ambassador. Now, before we close, uh, the EU delegation has actually prepared a fun quiz for us. Okay. Uh, <sighs> now, if you answer the questions correctly, you will be receiving a goodie bag with cool gifts and prizes. And there are only going to be three questions and they're all multiple choice. So to answer, please use the raise hand feature and I will choose randomly from there. So let's begin. I'll begin with the first question. Be ready to raise your hands. All right. First question. The European Commission is the executive arm of the European Union. It promotes the general interest of the EU by proposing and enforcing legislation, as well as by implementing policies and the EU budget. Who is the president of the European Commission? Is it A, Charles Michel, B, Ursula von der Leyen, C, Joseph Burrell, or D, David Sassoli. All right, number, our first person to raise their hand is from Upeha Mudita Sandi. What is your answer? Um, it is uh, B, Ursula von der Leyen. Ambassador, is that correct? That's yeah. the <laughs> answer. Well done. <laughs> All right, uh, second question. Please lower your hands. Second question, the motto of the European Union first came into use in the year 2000. It signifies how Europeans have come together in the form of the EU to work for peace and prosperity, while at the same time being enriched by the continent's many different cultures, traditions, and languages. What is the motto of the EU? Is it A, united in diversity, B, solidarity for all, C, liberty, equality, fraternity, or D, imagine all the people. Please raise your hands. From UE, Michael Jason. Thank you. Uh, the answer is United in Diversity, it's B. Sorry, was it United in Diversity? Correct answer. Yeah. Okay, all right. Thank you. Thank you. And for the third question, the EU has launched a package to support partner countries in the fight against the coronavirus pandemic and its consequences. The objective of the approach is to combine resources from the EU, its member states, and European financial institutions. What is the package called? Is it A, reopen EU, B, build back better, C, team Europe, or D, together we are EU? Please raise your hands if you know the answer. I'm pretty sure we discussed this during Ambassador's speech. So I hope you guys were listening. Uh, ah, okay, from UPNVJ Muhammad Dafa. I believe I heard Team Europe before, but I don't know if, if, if it's correct or not. Team Europe? Correct, Ambassador. Yes. <laughs> correct answer. Lucky me. And congratulations. We've come to the end of the quiz. Congratulations to the winners. And we will be contacting you after this to send you your prizes.
And with that, we have come to the end of our ambassadorial lecture today. Once again, thank you very much to His Excellency Ambassador Vincent Paquette for your time and also to all the students who have joined today. We hope to see you in our future events. Good afternoon. Thank you very much. Bye bye. Thank you very much. Bye, bye everyone.